for um, attending and giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. So what I want to talk about today is how to increase activity in your online community. And the reason I want to talk about this is that at the moment, the approach that most organizations are taking to developing online communities isn't working that well. And of the times when it is working well, there isn't much of a plan behind it. There isn't much of a strategy that is in line with community principles. And so at the moment, most community managers are doing this wrong. For most community managers, there's a far better way to generate activity in their online community. And there are three major issues that tend to be happening right now. The first is that most community managers aren't stimulating activity directly. So by that I mean there are a lot of community managers out there that wait for activity to happen in their online community and then respond to it. Most people in their community spend far more time reacting to what happens in their community than directly stimulating activity in their community. The second thing that tends to happen quite a lot is that when community managers do have activity, they don't manage that activity that well. And by that I mean the platform might be not, su not suited or designed to handle the level of activity they have. The level of social density might be quite weak. I will come to that concept a bit later on. And third, not many community managers are doing a good job of sustaining activity the right way. If you want to sustain activity in an online community, then you have to proactively develop a strong sense of community. There are some exceptions to this rule, but they are generally the exceptions. And for most online community, the challenge is socializing your members, getting your members to really feel like they are part of a successful online community. And there's certain proven concepts that are relevant here that I want to talk about during this um, webinar today. So let's begin with stimulating activity. We know from a range of online communities and a lot, a, lot, a lot of theory about how communities develop that there are generally three ways to directly stimulate activity in your online community. The first is to stimulate discussions in your online community. So that is to come up with a good idea for a discussion, regularly stimulate them, then reach out and invite other people to participate in that discussion. The second, as you can see, is to have regular events and activities in your online community. If you have regular events and activities, then you can regularly count on activity taking place in your online community. And the third is having good content in your community. What we'll find later on in this webinar is that the way most communities approach content is very much the opposite of what they should be doing. And there's a different way entirely of creating very good content for your online community and that's what I want to talk about today as well. So let's begin with discussions. If you look at any discussion that's taking place in the community, the purpose, whether that's a stated purpose or not, will typically be one, that note, will always be one of these three. It will be A, to convey information. So if I ask someone what the time is and they tell me, that's a conveying information discussion. Second are bonding related discussions. So if I ask you what your favorite watch is, that is generally more of a bonding related discussion. We're getting to know each other as a result of that discussion. And the third are what can best be termed status jockeying discussions. This is where we are through the art of conversation, comparing ourselves to each other and jockeying for status amongst the group. When we talk about our own achievements and our own experiences, what we're doing in a very much subconscious way is jockeying for state for status amongst that group. And while stock, uh, status jockeying discussions can get um, a bad reputation, it drives a lot of the good activity that we want in online communities. And what tends to happen too often in communities is that the community focuses too much upon conveying information discussions over bonding and status jockeying. And what you'll see is that the discussions that tend to get the biggest response are those bonding related discussions where people can talk about the love of the topic. So if you look at this slide here, for example, you'll see that the bonding related discussion, and this is just one, one example of many, you'll see that the bonding related discussion has the biggest response of any discussion that's out there right now. 
you'll see that when so this is from a um, online community about coins or for people for people that collect coins and you'll see that any Kennedy nuts out there where Kennedy is a type of coin and it's where PE people can talk about that and they can share their passion and their enjoyment of that topic and then get to know each other as a result. Then you have the two status dropping discussions. So the Rosie album discussion at the top, you'll see it's someone comparing their collection to other people's collection. There's a status dropping aspect to that, um, as a result of that. And you also see that trying out new ways to present coins, it's very much the same thing. And you'll see these types of communities, uh, these types of discussions rather, taking place in all types of online communities. And it's important if you're developing a community right now to have more of the right types of discussions. Don't solely rely on conveying information discussions. Make sure that you're also highlighting and facilitating status jockeying discussions and bonding discussions. Next, if you want an answer, if, you want, if you're in a type of online community where you're struggling to get it off the ground, then try asking questions and mix up the open and closed questions that take place in your community. So I'm sure most of us are familiar with this already, but if you're new to online communities, what you'll typically find is that it's when you ask a question, and when you ask a question in the subject line of a discussion itself, it gets a far higher response than simply proposing information or sending information across. And this is true across pretty much every online community I've come across. It's nearly always the discussions that ask a question in the subject line, or more broadly, discussions that ask a question that get a bigger response. And you can go further here as well. So within that discussion, we know there's data from people that have studied online communities that when that discussion contains an element of self-disclosure, so for example, when you're asking a question and, and it reveals some information about you in that question itself, then it's far more likely to receive a response than if it's just a question. So it's amazing what a fine art it is to ask the right types of questions that tend to get response from people in the community. And what you also have to be doing here is initiating and encouraging the types of discussions that facilitate self-disclosure. So we know that if you want to bond members into a group, then they have to build strong relationships with each other. And to build strong relationships with each other, there's a process they go through. And that begins with interaction and then moves into self-disclosure, where we're revealing something about ourselves to other people. That can be experiences that, that we've been through, uh, what we think or feel about certain things, or just generally information about ourselves. And it's these types of discussions that tend to bond people into a group. And in fact, it's these types of discussions that tend to get the biggest possible response. So if you look from um, Bur uh, Bur a barista exchange, I think this community is called, and this is what one of that you can look up. It's a great example of a successful online community. You'll see that discussion about how you learn to roast is very much a bonding related discussion, but it also encourages a very high amount of self-disclosure from people that are in the community. So it gets a very high response. Another great idea for getting good tactics, um, for getting good discussions in the community is to steal popular discussions from other online communities. So what I mean by this is that the same discussions tend to work in all online communities. And you can go, and Ning has hundreds, th thousands even, of successful online communities. And you can go through these communities and find out what discussions are working in one online community, and then apply that to your online community. So for example, using a Barista Exchange again, which I use repeatedly through this uh, webinar, you see here that one of the most popular discussions is things not to say to a barista. Well, you can take that discussion and you can apply it to any number of different uh, online communities things not to say to a community manager, things not to say to a web designer, things not to say to a footballer. There are so many different types of ways you can apply that. And so if you want a great way to stimulate a lot of um, exciting discussions in your community, then it makes a lot of sense to go to the other online communities that are out there and look to see what discussions are working really well for them and then borrow those discussions, apply them to your online community. And you'll find this in many different types of online communities. When you have discussions that are comparing two different things and they're phrased in a certain way, you can take that and you can apply it to your online community. You should never be sure of really great discussions that you can ask in your online community. 
And you'll see it in so many types of online communities. So this one, I think, is um, Rock and Roll Tribe, which is another great uh, online community on Ning. And you'll see that the types of discussions that tend to work well, you can see what people are really interested in. So when you see a thread, the great what are you listening to thread, that can also be taken in so many different contexts and in so many different ways, if not taken directly, and applied to your online community. So you should never be sure of the types of discussions that tend to work well. And in fact, there are a lot of um, conversation starters that we've developed throughout the year which tend to get a big response. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you should use all of these, but these are some very simple ones you can use to get activity going in your community. So for example, how did you become interested in the topic? What's your biggest achievement in the topic? What do you love most about some specific thing? What would you change if? So there are lots of very good, simple bonding and status-related status questions that you can ask to initiate activity. What we also find that it's often not enough just to initiate this question or just to ask a question. It's also a good idea to make that a sticky thread and link to it in the content and in the newsletters that go out to your community. This then gets the whole community participating in a shared activity, which is a great way of building a much stronger sense of community. So some action points, if you want to write this down or if you're going through this, uh, web, this webinar on, on the recording, what I would recommend you do at this stage is to plan out what discussions you will initiate in your community over the next month. I mean, really plan this out. So one discussion every two days that you're going to directly initiate. And what you can also do is that you can look to successful self-disclosure dis discussions that are taking place in your community already. So discussions where people reveal their thoughts and feelings about the certain issues or details about themselves. And you can turn them into sticky discussions in your community, discussions that can stay there for a week where more people are going to participate in that. And third, review popular communities and steal their best discussion. If you just do these three things, then you'll probably find the level of activity in your community begins to go up and up and up. Because now you know what types of discussions to look out for, what types of discussions to initiate, and you have a, pr a process for deciding what works best. And another final point I'd like to make is that when you are initiating discussion, mix up the open and closed discussions, but gradually move it from closed discussions to open. So a closed discussion is a very simple answer. Do, do, do you think that this is A or B? So those discussions are very easy for members to participate in. And in the early stages of communities, people tend to want these discussions because there's a social fear of participating. People are reluctant to be the first person to give a response, or they don't know what context or ca characteristics that response should have. So if you make it easier to participate, people get into the habit of participating. And then you might gradually go from the 70 to 30% split of open to, sorry, from close to open to 30 to, 30 to 70 um, as your community is, uh, develops. So the more mature your community is, the more open questions that you should have in your community. Next, I mentioned early on that it's a good idea to initiate regular events and activities for your online community. And the reason for doing this is that when you have regular events and activities, you always have things that members can participate in. You can always have regular activity that you can rely upon. Most community managers I know right now don't have regular events and activities in their community. And I think by not having that, they're really missing out. If you look to most successful online communities, what you'll find is they do have these regular events and activities. And we're not just talking about online, we're talking about uh, offline as well. So for example, there's no shortage of possible events you can have. So we can categorize these by regular and irregular and online and offline, as you can see in the table here. So what we like to have is regular online activities. So you schedule these on a weekly basis, say Wednesday at seven o'clock, then people will always have a reason to visit your community at, um, on, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. So you might have a regular we uh, webinar, for example, with a VIP in your sector. You might have a live discussion that's taking place in your community around a particular theme. So for example, you can ask your members what their biggest challenge is or what their biggest problem is. And then you can start discussions about that or you can have a chat session that lasts in, in a chat room for, say, one hour, where that feature is only available in your community for that specific time. Uh, you can also do weekly interviews with a VIP. So it's not as difficult to reach VIPs in your sector as you might imagine. And when you get these VIPs participating, 
people in the audience can ask questions and it's much more an interactive experience. You might do competitions or challenges. Um, if you do a quiz, that tends to work well in most online communities. And in fact, you can still the format of a pub quiz, if you like, um, where you have teams and people can answer questions. Just make sure the answers aren't things that people can look up on the internet. You can also have regular events that help the new the, the newcomers to the community orientate themselves. So newcomers in a community tend to ask questions that have been asked a billion times before. But you can have a specific day where people can ask those questions and get help and get support. You can do regular events or awards, say newcomer of the month or newcomer of the year or member of the month or things like that. There's so many regular events that you can have. Or you can do um, elections as well. So if you're the type of community, community that relies upon volunteers participating, you can have these elections that take place in your community where people can, nom can nominate who gets to that level of responsibility and you can have mini campaigns. So it's quite easy to make your community a very fun place where people go and participate. And it's most important that you do this. Every successful community builder throughout history has made sure they have regular events that take place, regular reasons for people to join a community, regular reasons for those people to participate in that community. In addition to that, if your community reaches a certain size, you might also like to have regular offline events. So there can be a ga uh, various gatherings in a certain area, or it can be more decentralized than that. And we'll come to an example in just a minute. But regular offline events tend to work best if your community is based around the local area. Otherwise, you're more likely to have irregular offline events. So these are the big one-off events for, for the community. So you have like say blog hub in the USA for example that's a one event where all the female bloggers also all the mother bloggers in the USA come together for that one event and there's, there's a lot of anticipation about it there's a lot of excitement about that and it generates its own activity because then you can ask discussions about what's going to happen at that event you can make predictions so it's very easy to get a lot of very good content going quite quickly and finally you can have irregular online events I know we did these in the wrong order. So ir irregular online events are good for building up excitement, building up anticipation, C helping members feel they've had some sort of shared history together. So if you have, say, an amazing guest speaker that can only appear once, if you have any particular member achievements, and by the way, I think it's a good idea to mention what your members are doing in your community. If they get married or have a celebration or have a child, it can be nice to have a notification about that in the community. We will come to that a little bit later on. If there's anything major that's going on in your sector that's likely to rally your audience together, any threat that you, that you face, any um, achievement that your community is being through, then it's good to have an event for that. And if you have a very mature online community, then a Hall of Fame style thing in a community can be a very good idea as well. So what you see, what um, Mumsnet does really well here, and Mumsnet is a very popular online community for parents in the UK. <clears throat> they have all sorts of events that are going on at any particular time. So in the top left, they have a web chat with a VIP in their sector. They have a competition that's taken place. They have a campaign of the week. They have a book club that's there. They have a recipe of the week. So there are always all these regular things that are taking place in the community at any particular time. So people always have a reason to come back and participate and proactively be involved in this community. The Economist is saying it's quite interesting, which is a weekly poll. So if you go to the Economist website, every week they'll have a poll which is on the most controversial or topical issue that's taking place. And people can vote, people can support their side. But it's not a poll that lasts just one iteration. People can provide new information, they can rebut the opinions of others. So it's very easy to get a lot of activity taking place around polls as well. And what Mashable will do is they do decentralized gatherings that take place offline. So they will set the day and then encourage their members to meet up around the world. So you can use meetup.com. Um, I think Ning might provide something here as well. I'm honestly not sure. Uh, where members can coordinate their own gatherings with each other. And all you have to do is be, is be a place that tells members where and when. Next, and the third part of the trio that I want to cover here is create content about the community. In my first online community, it was a video gaming community. And one of my jobs as a community manager was to create great content for the community. 
And our definition of great content at the time was the latest news about various video games and the gaming sector that's taken place. The problem with that is that, A, it's really hard to get the latest news first. All of my news was taken from other websites in the sector that had good contacts, basically. B, by getting that news from those sites, it meant that I was a, I was a competitor to the very sites I wanted to help me and promote my online community. And C, it's not very motivating to get this sort of news. This sort of, sort of news isn't what gets people visiting the community again and again. And what I found instead is that one day when I was very short on news, I wrote about an activity that took place um, amongst a few, a, few, a few of the players in the community. So one of our players won an event. And so I wrote a story about that. And the next day, instead of having one or two comments, I had 20 comments. And I thought, okay, there might be something in this. And so I wrote more content about what people in the community are doing, what the top players were doing. Then I moved on to big, ri uh, big rivalries in the community. I began doing interviews. And we found by doing that, the level of activity skyrocketed and it became so easy to create content because I was just talking about what people in the community are doing. And even more importantly, our content was entirely unique. We weren't competing with the big sites anymore. What our content was, in essence, was a local newspaper for our community. If you ever read your local newspaper, you'll find that it's simply content about the community. It mentions the names of people that are in the community. And this is what your content has to be in your community. So the written articles that appear in your community should be about what's happening in the community. It should tell people what's going on in the community. It should spotlight the key people in the community. It should get people participating and, in, and uh, interacting in that community more. So there's so many types of great content that you can create quite quickly. So you can have regular and, um, and, and announcements that's going on. So if your community is created by, say, an organization, you can have announcements from the organization. But try to limit these because they are that, that interesting, unless they directly impact the community members in a major way. But what's more interesting is having regular news. So imagine if you aim to have one news post a day. And by doing that, you'll find that members have a reason to visit the community every day to see if they've been mentioned, to see if people that they know have been mentioned. So this latest news might, might be the latest events that have taken place in the community. It might be an announcement about who's just arrived in the community and some details about the new members. And that, by the way, is a great way to convert more newcomers into regular members of your community. So you might also write news about what the latest and most popular discussions are in your community. So if you have a discussion like we covered a few minutes ago, that's becoming quite popular and lots of people are participating, you might want to mention that as a news post that other members in your community will see and then they will also participate. So this then becomes a universal discussion that everyone participates in. If any member has made a really great contribution in the community, a really insightful post or anything like that, then you can write about that as well. If there's news about members, if they've changed jobs, given birth, got married, whatever, this is good news because it helps bond that community together. It helps people feel that they know who the other people in the community are beyond just their interest in that topic. And that really does a great job for pe getting people to visit the community to see what's new rather than just visiting because they want information. And finally, if there's a particular issue of fundraising or campaign that you're involved with, then having updates on that is good because you can show the progression and it's a great way for having people engaged and participating on a regular basis. Other things you can do, and, and I mean, you can look at any local newspaper or any magazine and you have so many great ideas for content, just make sure it's about people in the community. So feature, feature articles work well. So you can interview the members that are in your community, the top members in your community. You can interview the VIPs in, uh, in, uh, in your sector and, and publish that. You can analyze a particular issue or even better. Interview, say, your 10 top members in your community about a major issue in your sector. Get their opinions on the issue and then publish that. And instantly you have 10 people that are going to share that with everyone that they know because they're being featured in, in an article. You can write any interesting stories about what members are doing or things that are taking place in the sector. Give you sur uh, surveys of your members and then publish the results as well. Or you can do pre uh, some previews or reviews of upcoming events. If you look at what the big news sites do, 
they're very good at doing this. They will preview what to expect at big upcoming events or what to expect with a new uh, product launch or what to expect um, next month, and then they'll publish that. And they'll also re review events that are taking place. So they also tell you what uh, what you've missed, how to catch up, what's worth following, what's not. And reviews also work very well with relevant services and products in your sector, because people are far more like to read them, especially if you've asked members what they think about it before you publish that. So that's one of the key things here. The more you get members involved in the creation of this content, the far more likely they are to share it with everyone else that they know. Next, it's also good to get regular opinions and guest columns from your members. There are two benefits of this. The first one is that if they're doing it, then you don't have to. So if you give uh, members in your community, so let me give you an example. I remember in my video gaming community, there's one member that's really passionate about strategy games, for example, and he would be posting a lot in the forums about them. So I invited him to write a regular weekly post about what's, what's new in the strategy scene and what people in the community was doing in the, in the strategy gaming scene. And by doing that, I didn't have to do it. It was regular content that I could rely on. So there's no reason you can't go out to your online community and find what people are passionate about, find if there are any niches or niches, as you say in the USA, and see if you can give them responsibility for writing a regular guest post or column about it that other people would like to read. And you can do this so many times. Um, or the opposite way of having a rotating guest column where every week a new member will share their thoughts or their predictions or their experiences about a relevant issue. Predictions are another thing that tend to get a really big response because everyone has an opinion on a prediction. And these are good when you have a new year that's coming up because everyone can make their own predictions. And a year later, you can see who was right and who was wrong and give points or whatever works for you. But I think you get the idea here. And finally, there's so much miscellaneous type of content. So you can do um, classified as well, where you mention the latest jobs or what members are buying or selling. Um, a few months ago, someone I met, we, uh, we were talking about the issue of spammers in the community, people that would come to promote their own products and services, or community members that would promote their own products and services, and how annoying it was, especially when they were members of the community. And this lady I was speaking to had a great idea. She goes, every Friday afternoon, I let my members write one uh, one uh, promotion. It can be for themselves or for other people, and they post it in a specific place in the community. The rest of the time, it's banned, and I kick the members out. But for this one Friday afternoon, they're allowed to do it. And most importantly, they usually do it with a discount and advertisement, and it's a great way to get members engaged and participating and get members looking forward to see what, is, what new is happening. It's like a Black Friday every week, you know. Another thing you might be interested in doing is a statement on behalf of the community. So what I mean by this is what a lot of media look out for are what relevant groups or stakeholders think about an issue. So if you, say, run a community for, mar for, mar for martial arts, and there's a major martial arts news that's going on or a key figure is involved in something, and you issue a statement on behalf of the community, it's not that difficult to get it featured in the relevant media. And it's even better if the community collaborates to write that statement on behalf of that community. And it's a great way to get your community mentioned elsewhere and grow the community, which we'll come to in the next, uh, uh, next webinar we'll do here. And finally, there's so many other types of miscellaneous content you can do. Videos about your members, um, top links that your members recommend, um, recommended uh, pro uh, products and, ser and services, photos, um, there's so much content you can do. But the key message again is to make sure that you're creating regular content about the community. And what you want to do with this content is to put it into a regular calendar. One of the key things I hope to get across in this webinar is how important it is to have a plan for stimulating activity in your community. Usually when I ask um, community managers how much time they spend uh, proacting in their community and how much time they spend reacting. They spend too much time reacting. And I was going to do a poll on this, but I realized that polls tend to crowd out everything else and you won't be able to see the, the webinar itself. But most people, from our experience, spend about 70 to 80% of their time reacting to what happens in their online community instead of proactively driving activity in their community. So by having a plan, you proactively know what to expect at each particular time. 
So a content calendar, for example, might look like this. It might have um, every Monday you do an opinion fe uh, feature on a particular issue. Tuesday is a guest column. Wednesday is a promotion for a live chat that's taking place. Thursday is a feature interview. So you can see that you can plan out activity that happens in your online community. And you can make it the type of activity that's going to get a lot of people participating. So TechCrunch, um, this is just a few examples of different content I've seen elsewhere. So TechCrunch do a good guide of reviewing upcoming events in their sector. So this doesn't just have to be your events. It can be any events that are relevant to you. Uh, Mixcloud does a great job of interviewing the top people in their online community. And if you do this right, it, it tends to be quite a popular thing because everyone wants to be featured in that interview. Uh, Mashable does a great job of shining the spotlight on the, tick, on the top six comments of the week. So again, people are more motivated to publish good comments, so they're far more likely to participate uh, as a result. So let's move, move on from creating activity in the community to managing activity. And by managing activity, I'm not gonna spend so long talking about spammers because that's more of a technical issue than anything else. I do wanna talk about social density. So social density is the number of people that are participating in the community within a fixed area of that community. So a low social density would be there's a lot of empty spaces in your community, but there isn't much activity. And too high a social density would be where there's too many participating, too, too many people participating in a particular area of the community that it's difficult to, for anyone else to follow what's going on and there's an information overload that's taking place. Information overload is typically what happens when more than, I think it was 40 people are participating within 20 minutes. That's the number we have from IRC. I don't know how it applies to online communities, but I imagine it's not too far off that. And if you find you're getting close to that limit, then it's a good idea to lower the social density. But let me give you some examples here first. So what you don't want when you launch an online community is a situation like this. If you look at this community right now, it looks extremely empty. There are so many empty areas of that community. There's so many empty categories in that community, and you don't want that. If this community launched just with that one popular category, just with that aftermarket uh, customized, sorry, the aftermarket customizing category, it would look okay. It would look like a community is just getting going. But when you look at it like this, it just looks like a very empty online community. And if the community looks empty, no one wants to participate in it. And that's why it's important that you have a high, a generally a high social density in your community without it being too high. So a good example would be what the East Dulwich Forum did. Um, so East Dulwich is a community around the local area here in the UK. And what you'll see is that when they launched the community, this was it. It just had three categories that were taking place. And if you look at it, you're like, okay, it's not thriving. And even here, they, they can remove that last category entirely. It's not, it's not a thriving online community, but it does look like it's active. It does look like it's participating. It's, um, it's worth participating in. And so what you think from here is that this is a community that has some level of momentum, and we want to participate in communities that have momentum. If the community looks dead, we're not going to participate in it. We don't want to waste our time in communities where we might not get a response, where we don't think there's many people that are participating. Look at the East Dulwich Forum a few years later on. And there, are, there are only so many categories I could get here um, before it, it got cut up in the slide. You'll see here, now the community is thriving. They have a relatively good social density. So there's relatively similar amounts of activity that's taking place in each of the categories. So what they noticed here is that there were lots of members that were interested in residential property in the area. So they created an area of the community specifically for that. They knew that there were people that were interested in businesses and trades. So they created an area specifically for that. And what you can do in your online community as the community grows is to identify what's popular, identify what topics keep coming up again and again and again, and create groups or separate forum ca uh, categories specifically for that area. This is a way of balancing out that social density. Because believe me, information overload is a really big issue in successful online communities. And if you allow your community to get too popular, you'll find that over a course of time, the level of activity and members that are participating plateaus, and then it begins to rapidly decline. And you don't want that to happen. So you have to make sure that you're managing that activity. And there's also a catch to this. 
So science forms here um, is another good example. So they have categories and subcategories, and I'm sure you're generally familiar with this. But the catch of this is that you don't want to do what I think this community was fire what was firearms talk, um, whatever your politics are. Around, um, so what firearms talk has done here? Uh, so firearms talk is a popular online co community for people that own guns. Whatever your pol your politics are, this is an interesting community to learn from. So they had a successful online community but they had too much activity that was going on in their discussions. So what they decided to do was to create a new form category for every single state. Now, I don't think I need to ask you why, why that's an issue. If you do that, you have a form that begins to look like this, where some states like Texas are very popular, while other states like Rhode Island have no activity whatsoever. <coughs> Sorry. And it's even worse than this. The popular categories are ranked really low down behind so many other states that never touch guns. So what they did, instead of responding to what was happening in their community, they did this top-down approach. So they looked to see what would be popular, uh, or, or they predetermined what would be popular in the community, and they created all these form categories. And that's the wrong way to go about it. You have to have a bottom-up approach for this. So you have to wait to see how your community developed find out what's popular in your community, and then create areas in the community for that. But wait and see what's popular before you create an area in your community uh, specifically for it. Next, give priority to activity in your community. There are lots of online communities that focus upon content. And content is great if you're building a content site and even in the context of content, as we've discussed it here, it's better to focus on activity. And by activity, I mean interactions between members. This is the lifeblood of your online community. This is what's going to get members continually, continually to visit your community and participate and be more involved. So it's very important that you give priority to discussions that are taking place between members in your community. Rock and Roll Tribe were one of my clients, I think about two years or so ago. And when they began, they had this big, big graphic you see here on the left that was taking up the whole middle um, area in the community. And one of the things we told them was to change it. Make sure that you're giving the discussions between members the priority in your community. Shift everything else to the side, shift the content graphics out the way, and give priority to this. And when they did that, they instantly found the level of, of activity began to go up and up and up. Because people see this, people take the cue, people see that's a site where they come to participate, not a site where they just come to read. Research change, again, is another good example. They have the latest activity that's taking place in the community right at the top, right there so you can't miss it. When you join the community, you see discussions you can participate in straight away. Um, I've forgotten the name of this the online community, but again, you see that even though they have a content graphic here, which I would typically not recommend, I know it looks good, but I don't recommend it. But by having those discussions as high up as they do, making sure they appear on the first page of that community, above the fold, which means above the point where you have to scroll down to see it, they get a lot of people that are actively participating in that community. People see the discussion straight away, and they participate as a result. So a few action points. Um, you can write these down, or you can catch up on this webinar later on. Um, actually, you know what we'll do? Um, after this webinar, I'll write it down in a separate sheet and Eric to, can send it out to everyone that attended. So the first thing I recommend you do is first is to remove or combine the quiet and, act and inactive areas of your site. So if you have categories that aren't very popular, groups that aren't being used or features that aren't being used, then remove them. Even if they're used a little bit but not much, remove them because this means that you have a lower social density in your community, and you want your community to look popular. You want to concentrate activity within a relatively few areas and only add more features and more categories when there's a demand for it. One of the biggest mistakes that we see people making with Ning uh, community specifically is that because they have a feature there that they can use, and it's very easy to drag and drop that feature in, they, they use it. Instead of thinking, thinking do we really need, need this right now, and the answer to that is nearly always no. They, they instead think, okay, we have this feature, what harm would it do if we add it in? And that's a big mistake to make, so I strongly recommend that you don't do that. 
don't use groups when you launch. Adding groups later on when there's a reason for it, when, when it's going to be popular. Don't take that top-down approach to it. Second, if you have too much activity which is taking place in your community, then see what topics are becoming popular in your community or build a place for that. Or what sometimes happens is that you notice there's a particular cluster of friendship groups or people that have a connection with each other. So you can reach out to them and build a place specifically for them in your community. Don't wait for them to do it. You can do this yourself. What is also a good idea is that when you do create these separate groups, find someone to run it. Find someone that's passionate about that topic to take responsibility for growing that group. And if they don't do it, if they don't make that group relatively self-sustaining, then merge it back in with the rest of the community. Also, when you do launch a new, new group, make a big deal about it. I wouldn't launch too, too many groups at once. Instead, I would launch one group at, at a time and then promote that group, invite people to join and participate in that group. Make sure that group is relatively, self, relatively self-sustaining before move, move, moving on to the next group. And finally, position activity, as we've just said, as a focal point of your page. You're not building a content site here. You're building a community site, a site where people come to participate in the community. And finally, to sustain activity in a community, you have to build a strong sense of community. One of the things we, we realized very early on about developing online communities is that the same elements are present in every successful online community. And that took us a while to realize what exactly those elements were. But once we knew what they were, and once we identified them, once we isolated them, we could use them as a blueprint to build any number of successful communities. And we didn't have a name for that for a long time until we stumbled across an article by Macmillan and Chavez Whitten in 1986 called The Sense of Community. So the sense of community is where people feel like they are part of a community. And there are four key elements as part of that. And when you develop a sense of community, you develop a community that lasts for a really long time. If you look at the oldest online community in the world right now, the well, which has just been sold back to, the back to the members of the well, this is a community that's nearly 30 years old. It's a community that has an incredibly strong sense of community, and all of the elements we're just about to cover are present in that. So there are four elements to a strong sense of community. The first one is membership. So I think I have all these as separate slides, okay. So the first one is membership. The second is influence. The third is integration and fulfillment and needs. And the fourth is that shared emotional connection. And I'm going to go through each of these now. So membership is how people identify one another in that community. So membership, um, there's several elements. The first are the boundaries that people have, cr have to cross to be an accepted member of that community. So by boundaries, we're talking about the experience or skills, resources, or characteristics that people have or they've acquired to be accepted as a member of that community. And what we find is that the communities with the strongest sense of community are also the ones that have the highest, bound, highest bound, bound, uh, boundaries to be participating as a member. So if you make a community for, say, the top 10 marketers in the world or the top 100 marketers in the world, you're probably going to get the 100 top marketers in the world to join it. And they're probably going to have a very strong sense of community. But the trade-off is that you have less people, obviously. But you get to draw the line of what that boundary is. If you're finding there isn't much of a sense of community, then you can change what your community is. You can make that concept of your community a bit tighter. You can add in an extra layer. So for example, using marketing again, because I'm very familiar with marketing, if you created a community of, say, marketers in the UK, that probably wouldn't be as popular as, say, marketers in London or marketers or non-profit marketers in London. So there are certain boundaries here that people have to cross, certain qualifiers they have to meet to join their community. And if you do that, you'll probably find that every non-profit marketer in London will join that community. But you get to decide what that boundary is. And I recommend for most online communities, they increase that boundary a bit. Not too much, but they increase that boundary a bit and that means they add in another demographic layer, so an age boundary or a skill layer, so a certain skill that people are, should, should, should have achieved or mastered to be accepted as a member of the community, or resource or experience that people have 
to be accepted as a member of that community. The second part of feeling an identification with other people in the community is emotional safety. So that means you have to be willing to talk about issues in that community that you wouldn't be willing to talk about elsewhere. So when Star Trek fans are discussing, you know, whether Spock would be an alligator in a fight or whatever, I really don't know. There, there's only certain places where they can have that discussion. And that means they have a very strong emotional safety. So what's important to happen in your online community is that members are talking about the geekiest possible things they can. Because this is a signal that this is a safe place for them to talk about those topics. It doesn't mean that every single topic has to be super, super geeky like, like crazy, but it does mean they have to have enough emotional safety and there should be a sign every now and then that people can talk about the topic, the geekiest possible thing in that topic. It shows that it's a safe place for them to talk about that. And it separates them from, from the mainstream society as well. That's generally a good thing. Next is personal investments. So by personal investments, we're talking about the amount of time that we spent participating in that community, the ego that we've invested in the community when we feel that a sense of competition with our peers for um, that social status amongst the group, and the emotional investments we made in the community as well. When the community has to revoke strong emotional feelings in us, we feel a stronger sense of identity with other people in that community. So the more you can solicit time investments in your community, ego invest investments in your community, and emotional investments in your community, when you can promote things that make people very happy, very sad, very angry, and I mean that in a, in a generally good way, the issues that people are very passionate about, they're going to feel a much stronger sense of community as a result. Fourth are common symbol systems. And I apologize here for the bullet point slides. It's the best way I could think of getting the information across. So by common symbol systems, we mean look at what words or phrases your members use that other people in society wouldn't use, or ideas that they have that other people don't have. And then you can make a list of these. What, sim what symbols, what words, designs, ideas have a meaning to people in your community, but have a different meaning to people outside of it? And then use those symbols in your community. So going back to my um, video gaming example, say 10 years ago, there's a player that went by the name of Slayer. Um, I love n the n uh, nicknames that people give themselves in communities, by the way. So this guy, Slayer, in a very popular match, got zero, got zero points. Um, he, he was a very arrogant person, but he got zero points. And after that, whenever that happened again, it was called to, to, to do a Slayer. And it's kind of an, an insulting thing, but it's a way a lot of people got revenge on a person that's very arrogant. But that became a symbol that we use for someone that did very, very badly in a community. So there are so many different symbols that have. Um, Element14.com, which is a good online community, they literally use a symbol as a name. So Element14 is a symbol that people that work in design engineering, I think, would understand because it's, a, it's something that they use on a regular basis. It's a material that they use on a regular basis, rather. Other people have no idea what it means, but to them, it's a clear symbol that this is a community for them. So any of our ideas, signs that you can use in the content of your community, you can name areas of your community after that. Um, so for example, if you look at um, Rock and Roll Tribe, an example we used earlier, you'll, you'll see the tagline to that is, fuck the middle age, let's rock. That's clearly a symbol that means something more to them than it does to other people. So there's no shortage that you can use, but it's a good idea to use these symbols that other people recognize. Next is influence. So in a community, everyone should feel like they have a level of influence over the community. If members feel like they can't influence a community, they're far less likely to participate. And in addition to that, the community has to be able to influence them. So that means you have to provide opportunities for members to influence a community. And it's not only that, you have to go beyond that. So not everyone in your community will be able to influence the community. Does that make sense? But instead, they have to feel like they could possibly influence that community. And that means you have to regularly feature the contributions of members in the community. A lot of community managers keep a stranglehold on the activity that happens in their community. They limit other people from being involved and participating 
And that's a big mistake because it shows members that they have no influence in that community. And the less influence they feel they have, the less likely they are to participate. So you have to provide opportunities for people to be involved, to help manage areas of the, of the community, do guest columns, moderate um, areas of the site, have responsibility for, for different groups. You have to be featuring the contributions of members in the community. And you have to, as we covered in the content, regularly write about the, uh, what members in your community are doing. That can be in your newsletter, in content, in blog posts that you have, but you have to shine the spotlight on members. This makes everyone feel that they could have influence over the community if they wanted to. Third is integration and fulfillment of needs. I love academic terms. So what this means is that the community goals are somewhat aligned with yours. So it means that you're getting what you need from the community and the community is getting what it needs from, from its members. So one of the things that we want is we craft our social identity in some way from the groups that we participate in. So we want our groups to have a high, their high status. If the group that we are part of has a low, sta low, sta low status, we're far less likely to continue participating in that group. That's why if say your sports team, or this is an interesting, an interesting study that was done. So a sports team that, lo that, that loses at, at the weekend has far less activity the next week than a sports team that wins. People want to associate themselves with successful groups. So that means there are certain things you need to be doing here. First is to be ensuring that the community is, fe is featured elsewhere. When you get your community mentioned, say, in local news or in local blogs, or if your community has a big achievement, you'll find that the level of activity in your community continues to go up. Another thing is that if you're, if you're a part of the community that attracts the best and brightest or whatever characteristic it is that is determined good by your members into your community, you're going to have more people participating. So one of the things that you should be doing is proactively targeting the best people in your sector to join and participate in your community. And that would be a steady process you go through. So you might begin with reaching out to them with a request for an interview and then follow up with some other questions and invite them to participate in the discussion, but gradually get them involved. People will participate in a community that has the best and most competent people in that community. And third, you want to target people that have the same values as people in your community. We'll cover this when we come to growth. But you need to be proactively making sure that you're reaching out to the right people to join the community. People that really share those values. And finally, before I lose my voice, shared emotional connection. So communities, or at least the really successful communities, oscillate at the same emotional fre frequency. So what we mean by that is that they think and feel the same things at the same time as each other. So communities are happy together, they're sad together, they're angry together. And this might be a little more difficult with an online community, but it's still something that's being studied and proven to be true. And for that to happen, there are certain conditions that need to be met. First, for members to feel like they have a shared emotional connection, they have to have regular contact with each other. So regular events, regular discussions will have a big impact here. The second thing is the quality of those interactions has to be high. And by quality, we're not just talking about conveying information discussions. We're talking about discussions where people feel they've got a lot of value out of that discussion. So that value can be in, so in social terms instead of just in um, informative terms. So if we have um, a quality of interaction where everyone is sharing deep down their thoughts and feelings about an issue, that's a very high quality discussion. One of the other topics relevant here is that off-topic discussions are good in most communities. They give people a reason to get to know each other beyond their initial interest in that topic. Third are uh, shared experiences. So when you have regular events that are taking place in the community, people have a lot of shared experiences with each other. So they feel like they've gone through a lot with each other. And by facilitating this and having those regular events and by provoking, um, what's the best word? Or provoking a feeling that people have gone through something that's quite intense or quite important or quite meaningful in any, in any, any particular way. And that means having closure to the events that you have. So having a defined endpoint, then having a review or summary of that event at the end that helps people have a much stronger shared emotional connection. 
And finally, have a shared history in your online community. One of the biggest mistakes that organizations make is that they do a very bad job talking about their own history. So most communities will have an About Us page, which is really dull and really boring. What we recommend you do instead is have an epic history. And by epic history, talk about how your community was created. Who were the first members to join your community? What were the big discussions, events, and activities that took place in your community? And have it as an ongoing narrative, something that continues to grow and develop as your community evolves. Make it epic. Talk about the major fights that happened in your online community, if you like. Talk about the scary things that happened in your community, the time where your community was nearly shut down. So it's much better to have a really interesting shared history that other people see and they can see where they fit into that narrative of the community than it's just to have an About Us page. Because people see that they can be influential in the community and it helps breed that shared emotional connection with other people in the community. So thank you for listening to this so far. Um, I'd like you to do one thing right now because I don't know how long we're going to have this offer up which is to go to www.fevv.com slash ning.html. Don't forget the HTML, please. And you can download half of my book for free, which will cover a lot of the topics we've discussed here in, in more depth. But what it will also do is that will give you a bunch of other ideas that you can use in online communities. It will also help you develop your community management frame, frame, uh, framework as well, a way for planning what's going to happen in your online community. So that's www.feverb.com slash ning.html. So please make sure you do this because as soon as this offer leaks out, um, we'll probably shut it down, I think. Um, but the sooner, the sooner you do this, the uh, more likely you are to get half the book. Um, and if you really like this webinar and if you want more ideas straight away, then you can buy the book on amazon.com. Just look up Buzzing Communities and it will give you a load more ideas on what we could cover in a one hour webinar. Um, and if you buy the book today, and if you send me your receipt by, um, if you send me your Amazon receipt, we'll send you a template we use from, for managing online communities as well. Um, but that is only available for today. So that's two things that you can do now. First, you can download half the book for free right now, pv.com slash ning.html. Or if you're feeling generous, um, you can buy the book and send us a receipt, and we'll give you our framework for managing communities. Okay, that pretty much wraps me up. Hopefully now Eric is going to jump in and ask some questions. If you have a question, you can use the question box on the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel. Okay. okay thanks uh, a lot, everyone. Um, if you have any questions, that's time. Uh, yes, uh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, people asked a ton. We'll, we'll take uh, eight or nine, however many we can fit in here. Uh, the first one from Anka, um, and this is a... A uh, question I hear a lot as well. Um, I would like to know if I should make the content of my network uh, public or not, or a community. I would like that everyone can read the agenda, but I'm afraid that people don't have a reason to become a member. So the big question, public or private? Um, generally, I would say public. But the reason I say that is people that join a community just to read the content in, in a community don't give you any uh, extra va extra value at all. The only time you should have it as a private if if that community is, is exclusive in some way. So if you're building a community for say the top people in your sector, um, then it's good to have that as a private. Otherwise, I'll make it public because it's very good marketing for your online community. Just getting people to join isn't really that difficult. Getting them to participate is far more difficult. So I would say make it a public, um, make your content as public as possible. Try and get pe uh, people to share it as much as possible. Because it's, all it is is free promotion for your community. Um, so that's what I'd recommend. Okay, great. Um, Tony asks, uh, and this is a, a, a obviously a big question. Um, how can you compete with Facebook <laughs> um, and the way your members interact there, and maybe not in your own community? Uh, the eight hundred pound gorilla. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is an interesting one in that some online communities it's really hurt and some it's really hurt. Actually, let me rephrase that. Facebook hasn't hurt communities that, that much because those same people go elsewhere. So that community go, go elsewhere. 
it just tends to be that you, you lost that community. So it hurts you more than what it hurts the community. But for other types of online communities, Facebook has proven terrific. It's gotten people to um, join, join up to receive alerts from, fa from, fa from Facebook and participate and be more involved. So what I'd recommend is that Facebook hasn't killed anywhere near as many online communities as what people think. And there are limitations to what Facebook can do. So Facebook, um, most people use a Facebook fan page, for example, which reaches very few, a very tiny percentage of their audience. So what I'd recommend is that if you build a strong sense of community, then you're far more likely to have a community that stays around your platform. If you make your community identity quite unique, where people go to the community because it's part of their unique identity, that means using a lot of these symbols that we covered before, people are far more likely to go to your platform. But if you're not doing any, any of that, if you're not crafting that unique identity, if you're not doing things in your, pla in your platform that Facebook can't do, so even form discussions between members, not that many people participate in discussions on Facebook fan pages. What they typically do is just react to what that post says. So what I would do for most online communities is to encourage people to follow you on your Facebook fan page and there publish the latest discussions that are taking place as a link. So for example, you know, Bob has a great discussion about blah, blah, blah. What do you think link and then share it on the Facebook fan page. So it could be an easy way of getting more people to join your community. So again, I know that it's going to be a really difficult thing for most people to do, but Facebook isn't the killer of communities as what people think it is. If you really are creating that unique identity in your community, then you will do fine. And in fact, the latest technology doesn't usually kill the communities before it. Um, the other part is that is you always have to adapt as well, but we can talk about that in another time, I guess. Okay, wonderful. Um, Bethany has a good question about um, making changes. Uh, do you explain to your community why you maybe removed certain categories or groups, or do you do it quietly in the night? Uh, it could cause hurt feelings, especially if you remove content of you know people that created that content, user generated content. So um, full transparency, or just rip off the bandaid and move forward. <laughs> Uh, this is a good question. This is a good question. So what I actually said was I only remove the areas that aren't that popular, which means the number of people that it affects should be relatively small. One of the hard things to accept as, as a community manager is that you can't please everybody. And there are times where you have to do things that are best for the community, but will upset certain people in the community. And that's really difficult to do because the people that are upset will, will be very vocal about it. You have to be careful that you're not catering to the vocal minority instead of the silent majority in your community. Most people in your community will, will, will probably be happy. If they're not complaining, they're probably happy in the community. It's only the vocal people, usually a, vo a vocal minority, that are unhappy. And if your data says that they're not using a particular feature of that community, then I would remove it. If they ask why, then I, then, then I, I will explain why. I would use the, the, the theory to explain why it's better for, for the community that it wasn't being used. And you can always add it in late, always always add it in late, uh, later on if there's a demand for it. Well, another idea you can do though is say, okay, if you can get say 50 people in the in the community to write to me and say that they will use that, then we'll then we'll add, add it back in. Um, so there are different ways that you can approach that. But I think the key thing I'd like to get across there is don't cater towards the vocal minority in your community because they probably don't represent the majority. So, so Facebook is a good example of this. When they introduced the wall, for example, which, not the wall, the um, stream, um, uh, as we call it now, they had a huge outcry of people that were saying, this is terrible, this is bad, this is awful, you know, we don't want this. But they stuck to their guns, they looked at what their data was telling them. And their data was telling them that the level of activity was going up and up and up. And so they kept it. And over, over time, people got used to it and they moved on. What tends to happen is that people like to defend the status quo at any particular time. So any change you make, some people are going to be against it. But you have to look at what your data is saying. Are they still using the community? Are more people using the community? And make your decisions based upon that, rather than what the sentiment of a, few, of a small vocal minority uh, say. OK, I've got another one. This one may seem trivial. Some people feel very strongly about it. 
Mike wonders, um, what is your view on profile pictures? Should a profile picture be a personal picture or an uh, image? Uh, does it matter? Uh, is it, and it sort of touches on that anonymity versus uh, be yourself. Um, I don't have a definite answer. So I think it's better if it's a profile picture of them because then people know who they're talking to and they feel a stronger sense of social presence with the other person which I'm not going to go into that theory here, but you can look it up if you like. Um, so it's good if it is that profile picture. But then there are so many occasions where that's not good. So for example, there are so many communities where they say talk, like team communities or communities where they talk about bullying, for example, where they wouldn't want that, where they want not to show who they really are. So I don't think it's as important as them using a consistent identity in the community, a consistent name or a relatively con consistent picture so people know who they're talking to and they get to feel like they know someone else. And in fact, um, what you can do if you do want people to add a picture to their profile is to make the default picture something quite funny or something that people would want to change. So I remember one of the communities I did on Lean years ago was a picture of a, smi of a very smiling pic. It was a very happy pic. But as dumb as it sounds, when people saw that, they thought, okay, I, I don't want that as my, pro my profile pic picture, so I changed it. So very simple nudge that you can have to get people to change it. But no, I don't have a, a fixed answer on that. It depends very much based upon the community. OK, great. Um, uh, Mark, uh, actually, I get this, a similar question from Mark and from uh, Wilhelm or Wilhelm. And um, I'm going to go ahead and send both of you uh, guys books. And if I choose your question and message you, I'll uh, give you an email address you can contact me and send me your address. Um, but if I miss you somehow, I will come track you down or you can come track me down on creators. Um, the question I hear here is how effective are sweepstakes in engaging a community? And the similar question that Wilhelm asks, do giveaways help? Um, so what are, what are your feelings on, on that kind of, uh, are they a, a quick fix or do they have their place? Um. So competitions in communities, I generally don't, don't like them because they tend to be a band-aid band, band for the bigger issue. If your community isn't generating activity of its own accord, then having a competition can usually just mask that issue. So competitions aren't sustainable in a, in a community over the long term. So you can have competition after competition after competition, but people aren't really getting to know each other. They're only participating because there's a competition. And if you need to do that, then there are more structural things that you need to change in your community. There's a different process you need to take and make sure that your community concept matches what people actually want. And also, if people are just participating because there's a competition, if they're only joining because there's a competition, that means they're joining for the wrong motivations. And that's going to make it much harder to, for them to participate on a regular basis later on. So I generally don't like competitions. Um, but if you are going to have a competition, then make sure that it's not a financial one. Make sure that is a, there isn't a financial reward at the end of it, and it's more about giving people, more, giving, giving people status in the community as a result. The other thing about competitions is that for you to win, someone else has to lose. So it's not a great incentive for you to share that competition with anyone else. And there's usually much, well, there's usually a lot of other different activities that you can do in your community that encourage people to bring other people into that activity rather than it is not to share that activity or proactively try and destroy someone else's hopes of participating in that competition. So they can win. Okay, um, that's wonderful. Uh, boy, you've got some great answers. I'm loving them. Uh, this one is from uh, Richard. He is across the pond where you are um, in... Uh, England, and um, he runs a, a, a network for um, lawyers, and it's a, quite a successful one, and he's very active on creators. Uh, he asks you, uh, how do you feel about daily emails to members uh, that flag content? Um, let's say we had a daily piece of content to drive engagement. Would a daily email alert get to be too much? Uh, as, as network creators, we're all very worried about people being turned off by too much email. So this is a question you don't need me to answer. So what you can do here is that you can look at what your data says. So you can test, say, doing two emails a week, one e email a week, five e emails a week, and look at how many people click on those links. 
If you can't track it in what Ning provides you, then change those links to um, bit.ly links, um, bit.l.ly, and do it there. So then you can see how many people are clicking on each of those links. And you can just see what your data says, what gets the biggest response, how many people are, o are opening those e emails, how many people are clicking those emails, how many people are then participating as a result. But what I would say is that content can work well in a new in a email newsletter. Um, but what I like more is having is using that newsletter to highlight the latest discussions that have taken place in the community. Because this tends to get people clicking to give their opinion on that discussion. So like we said earlier, when we're saying if there's a discussion where Bob says X and Jody says Y about this issue, what do you think, or what, or what, or how, or how, or do, or do you agree with that? Do you agree with her or him? Click, click here and let us know. That's far more likely to get someone joining and to participate than getting someone clicking that link to read. And I always want people visiting a community to participate, not to read. Did that help? Uh Yes, absolutely. Um, at data, data, data. We hear it all the time. It is hard for us to, to always fall back on that. We know we should, but um, we, sometimes we, uh, I, know I, I, I know I need to go for the data, but sometimes I want to wing it as well. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that reminder about the data uh, and paying attention to that. Um, so uh, Michael has a question. Uh, he, his community had a long period of inactivity, and now um, that we're um, actively adding content, He's not getting the member visits the way he, the way he had hoped. So he's lost some momentum. Uh, what type of messaging in a member broadcast would be most effective in getting members to visit and log in again? You mentioned just now, which may answer that question. You know, discussions. But um, is there any is there any particular messaging you think is effective? So I think the entire approach has to be a bit different if you're trying to revive a community you used to have, because most people have put that community name and its association has been a certain block in their heads and they're probably going they're, or they're probably choosing themselves to ignore a lot of that um, so what you can do I mean there, there, are, there are things you can change like who the email is from and um, you can have it from from you instead of from the community name or you can change what the subject line is you can change the messaging and all that but I don't think that's going to solve the key issue you have if your community has really died, then what you have to do is to begin like you're developing the community all over again. So reach out to five of the people that are in the community, ask them if they're still interested in being involved, um, ask them if they're interested in, in restyling the community or jump-styling the community or being the, the, the founding members of the new community. Founding members, by the way, tends to be a much bigger motivator to get people to join and participate. Um, and, and then find out what they're interested in, what their hopes, fears, aspirations, or the biggest challenges are, and start a discussion based upon that. And then once you've got some responses, once you've reached out to these people to participate in that discussion, then reach out to five more people then, and then five more, and then five more. And you have to get that small group going. So every big online community begins as a small online community. And then only once you've got some sort of community going again, by those regular direct contacts by email one-to-one, -one, would I then consider doing a email out to all the past participants? So I would highlight one big thing. So probably activity that's taken place within the community, probably a big event, I think, um, that they can participate in. So we're interviewing this VIP expert in your in your sector. Um, you could sign up here and ask any questions. So they have something that's of immediate value to them to join and participate. And once you have that event, then I would also initiate discussions based upon that event and remind people to say, um, Mr. Whatever said this, 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 do you agree from this event? We'd love your, your thoughts, click here. So you can gradually ease people into being members of that community again, um, rather than any messaging you do right now. But this is something that you do like a month from now. Right now, you just need to get some activity going on there. Otherwise, you're just getting all these people to visit a pretty much dead online community now. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to do one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, uh, this is kind of a, maybe an easy one, maybe a hard one. <laughs> so subjective, but I'm going to ask it anyways. How many members does it take to reach critical mass? So in general, he asked, <laughs> Steve asked. So just give us an idea of what you think, if you were starting a community today, um, what kind of benchmarks might you might want to uh, set for yourself for the first three months to 
to, to reach that critical mass. Sure. So critical mass for the people that aren't familiar with the term is a point of when the community begins to sustain itself. So that's when more than 50% of the growth and activity that's taking place in a community is, is generated by the community as opposed to being generated by the community manager. The mistake a lot of organizations make or a lot of or what a lot of community managers make is that they think they need a critical mass of members instead of a critical mass of activity. And whilst members is important, you don't need anywhere near as many members as what you think to get the level of, level of activity you need to reach critical mass. So what we do when we're launching an online community, and I'm happy to share this with everyone, is that first we'll build a list based from um, our existing contacts, um, people that talk about that topic on Twitter, that comment on other blogs or Facebook groups or LinkedIn or anywhere else where we can reach people or prospective members. This will usually be a list of up to 250 people that we can reach. And then we will begin inviting them or interviewing them um, for the community, get some data, asking them what they're really interested in, what their hopes, fears, aspirations are, what the biggest, well, what the biggest challenges are. And then, as I just said before, we'll initiate discussions based upon that, and then gradually begin inviting these people to participate in those discussions. What we're looking for, and this is very vague, but between 50 and 150 active members in the community, that is usually the point of when the community begins to take off by itself. Um, any more than that, and we find it's difficult to keep all these members active in, uh, in the first place. Any less than that, then it's difficult to have enough um, activity going on there within an amount of time. So it's very important that you don't just get people that are joining, but you have active participating members, people that are interacting with each other. And that's why we recommend inviting five people at a time, because then you get the momentum that's building up and up and up, rather than say inviting all 250 at a time. And the reason it's 250 is that we know a lot of people are going to join no matter what. But rather than instead of getting 250 at a time, where the level of activity can, tends to go down over time instead of going up. So 50 to 150 members is what we're looking for, but your process of doing that is very important as well. Okay, well, I just want to thank you. You have fabulous advice, um, and we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, we'll send out some follow-up emails to everyone that attended. Um, uh, you know, to give you a recording. Uh, um, the a link to the half book and uh, all that. Uh, Richard, I just want to really thank you for uh, sharing your expertise. Uh, it's always great stuff. Well, let me just say thanks to you to having me and for everyone that's listening all this time. I know we've gone over time in a big way, um, but thanks again, everyone, for um, listening. And it's an honor to have this opportunity to speak to you. And hopefully we'll do it again soon. Um, again, if you want to download half the book, it's feedbeat.com slash ning.html. If you want to buy the book, then it's amazon.com buzzing communities. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.